I want to welcome all of you here, and uh, I know it's raining heavily, and um, we thank the Lord. Uh, I want to welcome Broderick back from Dubai. We weren't sure whether he would get back here uh, this weekend, just simply because uh, Dubai is flooding like crazy, you know, and uh, so we're thankful that the Lord has brought him back safely. You know, um, I also want to thank Yanni for uh, leading us in that beautiful time of worship. And, you know, we're just so thankful that, you know, some, isn't it amazing how God uses people to bring us into his presence? Amen. And sometimes I just think that that's just the most amazing thing, that God would use human vessels um, to open a portal for us to touch what is heavenly. Amen. And I think that that's perhaps a real desire in my heart as well, that... You know, Lord, will you use me to be a portal that people can encounter you? Amen. And uh, I, I really want to just set that vision for every one of us because I think that that's what God wants to do uh, through us. Amen. I also want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, invite some people, um, you know, if you are, you know, at the end of the service, if you are going through anything in particular in your life that you need prayer, I want to encourage you to come. And we are going to pray for you, okay? And uh, if you're about to go for some kind of an operation or something like that, I, I want to ask you not to um, go through this alone. I'll put my mic a bit nearer, okay? So you can lower the volume a bit. I'll put it nearer, yeah. And, uh, and we want to pray with you. And we want to stand with you through your physical ailment because I want to say this, that when you are healed, when you are made well, it's a testimony to God's goodness. Amen. And, and we want God to be glorified always. Now, um, I want to give a couple of words of knowledge that our team gave. If your right wrist, there's a sharp pain. If your right ankle, there's a sprain. Or you, are, or, you're in, or you have had a stroke and there are still side effects remaining. At the end of the service, don't leave. Come to the front and we have a team and we would want to pray with you. And I think that God is not a gossip. And God tells us these things because he wants to show his power, and his glory. Amen. And he wants to heal those with these conditions. So if that's you, come. And uh, at the end of the service, we want to pray for you. Now, I also want to update the church that, you know, we mentioned that we were hoping to move next week to Grand Troll, But unfortunately, there's some delay in terms of the applications uh, for the permits. So we are going to delay it by a week. So we are planning to move on the 4th of May. Okay, it's 4th of May, and watch out on our social media. We'll keep everybody updated. And uh, yeah, you know, we just pivot with uh, what happens, amen. And we thank the Lord for all that happens, and we know that there is always a purpose. Even if there is a delay, and uh, we trust that God and His wisdom uh, is working everything out. Now, this weekend, right, just because of the fact that we're going to be uh, moving and uh, to to Grand Troll, I really feel like I want to speak something and to help us understand you know, how God sees buildings and places. Amen? How does God see buildings and places? By talking about the purpose of a place, okay? And, and I hope that this will bless you and I hope that this will help us to maybe kind of properly uh, balance, you know, how we look at a place, how we understand a place, and as a congregation, as we enter into Grand Troll, that we will really know that it's more than just a place of being comfortable and uh, more than just the fact that we don't have to do set up and tear down anymore, and, uh, but that we really kind of look at the place and say, hey, we have a mission while we are here. Amen. Now, several years ago, I had a series of dreams, and in one of the dreams that I had, right, I, in my dream, I was, I was confronted by this... Um, um, you know, group of um, older, like in their appearance, they were like uh, older people with beards, you know, and, I, and in, in the dream, it was very clear they were these old sages, a company of these old sages in heaven, and they were there, and they were talking about different things, and one of them walked up to me and spoke to me, and then, in fact, it was very clear he spoke to me about the subject matter of buildings and properties, and then he said this to me, he remarked with surprise about how churches today is so obsessed with buildings, and how contrary this is, the, uh, this is to the approach of heaven. It's so different from the way heaven looks at buildings. Amen. And then he told me that God understands that we need buildings and we need properties and that God will provide these for us. But then he sounded a warning to me. He said, Lip, when it comes to buildings, understand that they are to be used and they are not to be made into an, a monument and neither are you to obsess over buildings. You know, I remember uh, I, I don't have very many dreams. I had that dream. 
and you know, and as I'm having this dream, he comes to this part, and then you know, there were other sages, and I wanted to go to each of these sages to hear what they would have to say to me. But in the dream, you know, the voice of the Lord spoke to me, and the voice said, "Wake up and write this dream down." You know, and um, and you know, and in the dream, I said to God, I said, "No, no, no, God, there are other sages. I need to hear what they have to say." You know, I'll remember one. I remember, you know, when I wake up, you know, and then I, and in the dream, very funny, the Lord again said to me, "Live, wake up now." write it down, you know, and then I woke up, I took my phone, which is always by my bed, and I opened a little note, and I just wrote the dream down. Now, let me say this, my dream is not the same level as the Word of God, okay? It is, I never place what I feel God is saying to me through dreams in the same level as the Word of God. The Word of God holds far greater authority than our own personal experiences, but nonetheless, the Bible also tells us that we are not to despise prophecy, but instead we are to judge prophecy and to see what God is teaching us and speaking to us. And, I wanna, and, and therefore it's important for us to sift through the wisdom that God is communicating what, to us through the prophetic word. And so what I want to do more than just talking about this prophetic word is to give us some sense of a biblical foundation for understanding buildings, properties, and places. Now the first thing is I want us to understand that there is a shift from places to people from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You see, when we consider the Old Testament, there is a definite focus on places. Amen? You can't run away from that. God's covenant with the Jewish people is built around a place. Right? Fundamental to the covenant are two promises. One is that Israel will grow without, and you know, into the multitudes. And the second is that they will, they will inherit the promised land, which is the land of Israel. Right? And not just that, there's always these significant places that are mentioned in the Bible, whether it is Bethel, it's Rehoboth, it's Hebron, it's Zion, you know, and all these places that are mentioned in the Word of God. And personally, I've preached about these places many times over the years in my sermons, focusing on the God encounters that have happened in these places. But you see, as we move into the New Testament, there is a definite shift in the focus. The prime proponent of this shift is none other than our Lord Jesus himself. In fact, in one of the most defining messages, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, right? And when he taught them how to pray, embedded in this prayer is a shift of focus from places or a specific place to a far greater thing that the Lord is looking at. Now, we may not notice this shift as Christians because we really don't understand the Jewish practices in the days of Jesus. You see, in those days when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, it is not as though the people didn't know how to pray. The Jewish people already had an established system of how to approach God and how to pray. In fact, there are several patterns of prayer. Primary amongst the patterns of prayer is this thing called the Amida. So the Jewish people would pray the Amida three times a day. And the word Amida means to stand. And so this is a prayer to be prayed while you are standing. Okay. And that's why Jesus, in, you know, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and you know, 7, he says, when you stand and pray, do not do this, but do this. Because he's referring to the Amida, which means to stand. And it's amazing, the Amida is made of 18 prayers and blessings and statements. Okay, if you look at the Amida, which is still being practiced today in Israel, it is now 19 statements that are made. But in the days of Jesus, it was 18 statements. And, you know, and, and this whole prayer is centered around Israel and Jerusalem. It is, as you, if, you, if you go search it out, you'll discover that this prayer is a deeply... Um, it's a prayer that is deeply centered around a particular ethnic group in a particular geographical location. The focus of it is not a prayer of global missions. It's a prayer about Jerusalem. It's a prayer about the people of Israel to fight for their enemies, to establish the nation of Israel. And yet the, the funny thing is that when Jesus prayed and he taught the, the, the Lord's prayer to his disciples, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, can you imagine how offensive this is for the Jewish people when Jesus said this? Now, today we read it and we pray this, we recite it and we memorize it and it means nothing to us because we have become so accustomed to it. But in the days of Jesus, when the Lord said this, it was offensive to the Jewish people because he was making a shift away from Jerusalem 
and away from Zion to focus on all the earth. The Lord says, not just my will be done in Jerusalem, in Israel, my will be done in all the earth that is this in heaven. The Lord began to shift the focus. And then in John chapter 4, he has this encounter and exchange with a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman poses a theological question to the Lord. He says, do we worship on this mountain as our fathers instructed, or do we worship in Jerusalem as your people, the Jewish people, declare? And the Lord didn't say, you know, my people are correct. The Jewish people, he said, no, the day is coming where it's not this mountain, it's not Jerusalem, but the Father is searching for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Isn't that amazing? That means that today, as we were going through a time of worship, the presence of God was manifested for real. And it was not manifested any lesser than it would have been in Jerusalem. Because God's desire is to manifest himself fully in every part of the world. Now this, if I could say this, was not just mentioned in the New Testament, but it is already seeded for us in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 66, verse 1 to 2, the prophet Isaiah declared this, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? Where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand have made, and all those things exist. And then the Lord says this, But on this one will I look. On this one will I gaze upon, on him who is poor, and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. This is the shift. This is the distinct movement that God was shifting us away from and towards. It's a move away from a place to a person. In Ephesians chapter 20, verse 20, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 to verse 22, it says this having been built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building is being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom who you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's not this building. It's not Grand Tro. I know some of you are thinking, oh, we're moving to Grand Tro, but TPI is so convenient, nearer to my house, you know. Some of you are saying, wow, oh, Grand Tro is very good, you know, it's just three stops away from me on the train station. Let me say this, it's not the place. What God is looking to indwell is not a physical place, it's a people. You see, when the Lord spoke to us about, you know, about this place, about this church, you know, in one of my times of prayer, the Lord said, I want to build and establish in this church a base watermark of the hunger for God. And when the Lord said that, I felt so clearly I saw people walking into church and there will be such a presence of God. And sometimes people, we, sometimes we come to church and we are all preoccupied with many things. Sometimes we bring our children to church and their attention is not really God. I had dad, mom, they, you know, they want me to come to church. They're forcing me to come to church. And just to satisfy them, I'll come. And I, I saw this in that vision. And what I saw was that as people came into the church, because there is a base watermark of hungering for the presence of God, that somehow as they're touched by the presence of God, something is stirred in their spirit that they begin to desire after the Lord. They begin to say, Lord, I want more of you. Hunger is stirred in them, right? But it is not in a place. It's because there is a people hungering for the Lord. Sometimes people come to me and say, hey, Pastor Lip, we are coming to join Life Church. We know that it's a small church, a startup. Is there any way that we can serve? And I tell people, hey, you know, one of the best ways you can serve more than just doing something or doing, you know, and of course we do need people to serve in different areas. But I'm asking for all of us the most basic thing that we can do in life church is to hunger for the, for the Lord. I mean, today, I don't know how it was for you, but during the time of worship, you know, I felt the Lord refocus me. I felt the Lord said to me, Lip, will you come, will you let me just focus you back to me? I am the agenda, you know? And, and the Lord is doing that in my life each time as well. And if we just come back to that, Focus on the Lord. This is why we gather. This is what is going to be the greatest attraction to the world. That they will come and they'll know that there is an encounter of God's presence that's available in this place. And it's not how beautiful this place is. It's not how convenient the place is. It's not how close to a train station it might be. It's the fact that there is a people that really hungers for the Lord. Amen? And the second thing is that there's not only a shift away from place to people, there's a shift from the natural to the spiritual. And by this, right, I want to talk a little bit and give us some understanding concerning the land of Israel. 
because we are, we are right now in a, in, a, in, a, in a political state or in a situation in the world where this can be a very, very controversial subject matter to talk about. Because there is a war going on in Israel, right? And, and you know, and emotions are riled up, you know, and people are taking sides about this. And as Christians, there's a natural side that we like to adopt and we like to posture ourselves on that side. And my intention is not to talk about who is right, who is wrong. I'm not here to give us the biblical kind of thing and say, hey, that as your Bible believe, then you must stand on this side, you must stand on that side, and who is right and who is wrong. This is not my intention. But what I do want to say to us is that the issues that are confronting the Middle East are very complex. And as Christians, I want to encourage us not to reduce it to simplistic taglines where we simply say, oh, we support this, or oh, we support that. And I don't think that that's what pleases the Lord. I don't think that that's what we're supposed to do. I don't believe that God, in, in, I, I don't believe that Christ ever adopted political positioning when he was walking on the earth. I think that what we really need to do as Christians is to pray for peace. Because the Bible actually tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace that is to be in the land. And I want to encourage us to pray for peace because I tell you the agenda of the enemy is to take lives and to destroy lives so that they don't have a chance to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And our job as Christians is to pray for salvation. Our job is to believe that there is a far greater peace than just natural peace on the outside. That every person needs peace on the inside. And only Jesus can give true peace on the inside in people's lives. Amen. So I want to begin again by saying this, that I don't believe in replacement theology whereby God's broken his covenant with the Jewish people. And, you know, I, in fact, I, I, you know, sometimes people say this, you know, nobody is, uh, um, uh, you know, everyone is, repla everyone is replaceable, right? And, um, you know, sometimes we say, you know, some things, you know, like, oh, nobody is uh, irreplaceable. If somebody goes, God will raise somebody up. I, I hate that statement. I absolutely hate it. I hate it. I've walked with parents who have lost their children. And you never tell a parent who's lost a child, oh, the child is irreplaceable. No child is irreplaceable. You know, I've got three boys, two, and you know, Aaron, Samuel, David. They're not replaceable. You cannot tell me if something happened to Aaron. Oh, never mind, never mind, he's got two more sons, God, Samuel and David. <laughs> you know, it'll never be like that. Why do we talk like that? Right? And in the same way, I believe that Israel is never going to be able to be replaced by the church. Right? And it's not meant to be. The unique promises that God has made to the Jewish people, God will keep it. But I believe that the Old Testament also cannot save anyone. And there is only one way unto salvation, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ, both for the Jewish people as, for, as well as for the Gentiles. But I want to give us some understanding about this. I want to help us understand how to read this sense of God's purpose for the land of Israel, okay? Because the Jewish people believe that the land of Israel is really important to the practice of their faith. And they believe so for two reasons. Number one, they believe the land of Israel is an ideal land, okay? And, and, and you know, and just as there is land that is ideal for certain crops, for example, if you want to grow a vineyard and you want to produce wine, there is certain land that is perfect and ideal for that. You know, I learned a couple of weeks ago that there are certain areas that is ideal for certain types of truffles. We had a lesson on truffles on a Thursday, open till. And, you know, and there's land that's perfect for certain crops, right? And, and the belief is that Israel is ideal for growing prophets and for a hearing ear. In fact, not just prophets, but a whole nation of divinely inspired people who hear their voice. So the Jewish people believe that, yes, you know, God is everywhere, God can speak everywhere, but there is nothing like Israel because in Israel, God awakens a whole nation to hear and it's connected to the land. This is how the Jewish people perceive the land. And of course, there, there's great truth. If you've ever been to Israel, everyone who's been there tells me this, that there's such a sense of connection with the physical places to the things that you read in the Bible. And when you walk the land, you literally think, hey, I'm walking on the very land and the place where I've read about in scripture. And that brings about a certain connection with what the Bible is saying, amen. Now, the second thing is that it also, they also believe that it is the place of an ideal government or an ideal system. You see, while God exercises sovereignty over all the earth, the Jewish people see the land of Israel as special, as being set apart 
for God. Now, God delegates authority of all the other Gentile lands to other authorities, but Israel alone is set apart to be governed by God and God alone. You know, it's, you know the, the, the land you know, is to be governed by the codes of the Torah, the Old Testament law. It's to be built, you know, the institutions, you know, it's, it's to be built upon the institutions that are sanctioned in the Old Testament and so on and so forth, right? Now, when you look at this, the ideal land and an ideal government, it talks about a place and a system. And now I want to take these two ideals and I want to transpose them to the church, because if you look at this at how the Jewish people believe it, what is the application for us? What is the application for us in the New Testament? I believe that you can literally take these concepts and transpose them to the church. For this is a parallel between the land of Israel as well as the church. You see, as Christians, you know, um, can we be Christians without being part of a church? Can you experience God even if you are not a part of the church? The answer is very simple, Yes. Right? When I was a young believer, I didn't go to church from you know, uh, 12 all the way to 16. Okay, the first four years of my Christian life, I didn't go to church. I wasn't allowed to go to church. But in those first four years, I read my Bible every single day. I read it going to school. I read it going back from school. I read the whole New Testament cover to cover over 40 times in those four years. Right? When, I was in, uh, when I was 15 years old, I read and I heard people praying in other tongues. And I went to the Bible in the book of Acts. I see that there is tongues. And I went to my own bedroom and I said to the Lord, I said, God, if this is real, this is from you, I want to speak in other tongues. And the Holy Spirit came upon me. I broke out in new tongues. Right? And all these happened when I hadn't even gone to church. Right? So can we experience God without being part of a church? Yes, you can. But the congregation and the community of God's people gathered as a church makes for an ideal place to grow. I, I could experience God outside, but my growth is not complete until I'm part of a church. This is an ideal place in an environment like that. Different people, different social economic status, different age group, different upbringing, different background, different race, different gender. And in this environment, as we work together, as we learn to love each other, as we learn to serve one another, we begin to grow in our walk with God. And this is true also concerning an ideal government because the, def the definition of government, the value system that we adopt here in church is a very different different value system from the system of this world. The Bible teaches us that to ascend, you have to descend. That it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That the Bible teaches us what it means to lay our lives down for others. And these are all very, very foreign concepts that the world cannot understand. And the more we begin to walk into this ideal government and system within the church, within our lives, within what we do, the more we'll begin to impact the world that is outside. So if I could say this, there is a shift from the natural land of Israel to a spiritual understanding of what it means. Finally, the th third thing I want to mention is a shifting from permanence to purpose. As humans, can I say this? I think we all desire permanence. Uh, if you've ever moved house before, you will know that every time after a move, you will think to yourself, this is the last time I'm moving, right? I mean, all the things you have to pack into the boxes and all the things you have to unpack, you know, and, and then when you have to move again, man, it's tiring. And if I could say this, we all want permanence in a place that we are comfortable with, in a neighborhood that we love, in a place that we love. And, and, you know, but somehow in the equation of God, in the understanding you know, and the embracing of God's purpose, there is a concept of impermanence that is taught to us in Scripture. There is almost a sense you know, that has been deeply entrenched in our faith as Christians of impermanence. Right? I mean, think about it. Some of the language that is there in the scripture that we are describing, our home is not here. Right? When a Christian dies, we say that the person has been called home to the Lord because this is not our home. Concepts such as being pilgrims, sojourners, aliens on this earth, right? And these are all things we're called to a country that is a heavenly one. And so, and so we begin to understand that our time on earth is constructed around God's purpose and agenda for our lives. And so this is not about permanence, but this is about understanding purpose. So as we move to Grand Troll, can I tell you straight off that our rental is three plus three, okay? Three years is the rental. After that, we can extend by three more years. 
Well, what's going to happen next? I don't know. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it wonderful that we can seek God again and wait on God and expect an adventure of knowing what God has in store? You see, the thing for us as Christians, sometimes we get so settled. And I want to encourage us in our own personal lives as we check through our lives, can I encourage us not to become settled? Amen? Not to become settled. I don't know how we can work that through, but I think it's very challenging. But I want to give us some examples of understanding a purpose of a place. So three examples I want to very quickly give us. The purpose of Egypt. You see, when God moved Israel into Egypt for 400 years, you might think to yourself, wow, what is the point of this, right? The obvious thing is to think that, hey, Israel moved into Egypt or the family of Jacob moved there because they're trying to avoid a famine. There is resource available in Egypt. There's food there, so they moved the whole family there. But can I say that that's not the purpose? The purpose isn't to avoid famine because if it was to avoid famine at the end of the seven years of famine, shouldn't they move out of Egypt? But they didn't. They stayed 400 years in Egypt. But instead, I want to encourage us to consider this, that when Jacob entered e Egypt, the Bible tells us 70 people went in. 70. 400 years later, you know how many people came out of Egypt? We don't know exactly. Uh, theologians estimate anywhere between a million to two million people. But it's a lot. From 70, in other words, they went in a family, they came out a nation. And literally, Egypt became an a incubator for Israel to grow into a nation. And that's a purpose. Sometimes God puts us in a place so that we can grow. Sometimes you are in a particular place in your job or wherever you might be assigned because God has a purpose for you to grow. Amen? Then there is a purpose of Adullam. Adullam was one of the hardest seasons in the life of David. At that time, he was a fugitive running away from Saul. Life was very difficult. He was living in caves. He was constantly hunted. His resources had to be scrounged for. And during that season, David's mighty men began to form up around him. And the Bible tells us that these were the 3D people. They were distressed. They were discontent. They were in debt. You know, they were all people in trouble, okay? But nonetheless, these times that David was in Adullam were times where there was healing that happened. There was training that took place. And what happened is that those years that he was in Adullam, not only did David train to become a king, his people also were trained to become captains and warriors and leaders, and that's what happens. So sometimes God calls us to a place and the purpose of the place is training. Training and equipping for a particular purpose that he has for us. Finally, the purpose of Antioch. The Holy Spirit was poured out in Jerusalem. And then after a decade, more than a decade, the church in Jerusalem was still not moving out to fulfill the Great Commission. Did you know that? Did you know that they never moved out? They stayed in Jerusalem, right? Right? And then God, so God began to move in a place called Antioch. And it was at Antioch, for the first time, believers became so distinctive. They became so different. They was, became so marked in who they are. They were actually called Christians. And for the first time in history, what happened is from Antioch, Paul and Barnabas were sent out. And this became the primary missionary movement in the book of Acts, through which the, through which the church has been characterized sin, since. And so the purpose of Antioch was really to create a distinctive in us, to make us different, and then to send us out on our mission, to get us focused back on the purpose that God has for us. Amen? And so again for us, what is the purpose of a place? Are you in a place where God is, you know, refocusing you back to what He's called you to do? Are you in a place where He's making you distinctive? in who you are, so that you will have a particular name, you will have a particular characteristic. I say all this because around about in February, um, you know, in, actually it was last year, I think end of September, we found this place in Grand Troll. And I think it was in October, early October, that we put a, a one-month rental in, you know, um, and signed a letter of intent to rent the place. Okay. So October, November, December, January, February. Five months it took before we got the approval from URA to use the place. So that's five months it took. 
And that five months was very difficult. That five months, I remember, you know, we would write in to URA, they'll come back, first letter was a rejection, and then we would write back to them and, and you know, cha make some changes, and then they'll come back and they'll, another list of questions. So every two weeks, it'll be back and forth. Every two weeks, every time they ask a set of questions, it'll take two weeks, right? Because for them, 10 working days, and um, praise the Lord, we have a very efficient and good government nonetheless, okay? <laughs> But at the end of five months, we finally got the URA uh, approval. And I remember it was one day before Chinese New Year Eve, Lunar, Lunar Chinese New Year Eve. So very, very thankful. Uh, I woke up first day of Chinese New Year. And when I woke up, I really felt the Lord said this, that he's placed us in Grand Troll for a purpose. Right? The strange thing is that he never told me what is the purpose. I, I, I'm not clear. I don't know what it is. But I, I just know that we are there for a purpose. And I don't know what is it. I don't know why. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't know. But you know, when God tells you something like that, you don't really need to know everything, do you? It's kind of like you take a step and then he tells you more. He shows you more. And I feel like sometimes it's so exciting to walk with God precisely when you don't know everything. That there are so many surprises waiting for us when we just obey God. Amen. You know, and I want to invite all of us on this journey with us, you know. Uh, we are going to move the 4th of May. We'll give you guys more details next week on the move, the time, where to park, what time to come, and what we're going to do after service. We're going to try and give you as much information as we can. We're going to enjoy this. We're going to have fun. The first um, service there, we're going to provide dinner for everybody, okay, and we're going to just enjoy the people, you know, in the place that God has given to us, and we, we're just going to have a great time. The kids are going to be with us, and then the week after that, we'll have proper children's church in a separate room uh, for them. Uh, we hope to be able to take you guys around the place, look at some of the exciting things that, you know, which floor the children's church are. But I, I think that there is something more. I think that there is something more than that. I, I want to encourage us that if, you know, God has spoken to you and you are like, you know, I'm going to be part of live church, I, I want to encourage you, if, if you're in that place and you're not just visiting, that when you go to Grand Troll for the first time, that you will really ask the Lord, says, Lord, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do here? And, and God may not show you immediately what he wants to do, but I pray that what will happen is that as you pray that, right, what will happen is that as you walk in the building, as you walk around the places, you bump into people unexpectedly and God will speak to you. We've been there for a while. You know, we've gone there a few times. You know, we, walked, we went to another unit and they were renovating. Their renovation looks very nice. So we went in and said, can we see your renovation? They said, hey, come, 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 you know. So we got to know the people a little bit. So I said to Viv, Viv, this is your harvest field. Avis, this is our people you're going to reach out to. Because the two of them were very excited. I didn't want to go in. But then they, oh, we must go in, must go in and see, you know. So, okay, so it's your responsibility to reach them, okay. And then one other time, we're there, and I walked out, and we were at the lawn, and as on the lawn, somebody shouted, Hey, Lip Yong! I turned around, and I saw this girl. I remember her. I remember uh, she was in Cornerstone some 20, no, some 20, 28, 29 years ago. And then she first thing she said to me, and we were there, first thing she said to everyone, Oh, he's the one who tutored me for A-levels, and I still fail. <laughs> So don't ask me to tutor you for anything, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, and then she's working in one of the units that's just opposite to where we are at, you know? And it's just amazing as you walk the place, I tell you, God will begin to show us the people that are in need. God will begin to show us people that you'll move our hearts for. God will begin to show us the things that needs to be done, that needs to be said, the lives that needs to be transformed. Because when we pray, God, what is your purpose here? God is not going to give us some reasonable, logical answer. But God's going to make us part of that purpose. Amen.